and then I'm going to open it up and save some time because there's not, we're not going to be able to cover everything that's in the handout or the slides that you have. And I've actually updated the slides through yesterday because there's a couple of new things that I've just added that continue to evolve. So I'm at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina now for 35 plus years. And I am a professor emeritus in the College of Pharmacy and a professor in the Department of Family Medicine there. And like I said, I've been there about 35 years, and my job has been my hobby. I retired, but I'm still teaching three to four days a week. I'm still active consulting and on various boards and those kind of things. So my disclosures are also listed on the slide for you. I am a consultant to Merck in the area of research, basically outcomes research. They bring us together a couple of times a year, a group of us, and ask us, what do we need to do with these drugs that we have in development in order to get preferential placement on formularies, to get physicians to prescribe them? What kind of data would you like to see? So that's where that comes from. And I don't think I have anything in the uh, presentation today related to that. And it's been more than a year ago, so I can take the second bullet off, but I was a formulary consultant for Pfizer and Bristol-Myers Squibb on a Pixaban, their 10A inhibitor for non vagra AFib, Eliquis, that's now on the market for that indication. And that's been more than a year ago, but that is in the presentation today, so, but I won't cover it unless you have questions on it. But those are my uh, disclosures. At this point, I don't speak for any pharmaceutical company. I haven't done that for a couple of years now, so uh, it's getting harder and harder to do anything with university rules and regulations as well. But I wanted to start with some stuff. I looked at the schedule for your meeting this week, and the information I want to try and cover is stuff that you might not have covered previously during the session that is important and updated. Immunizations are constantly changing. And just to give you a background, immunizations first have to be approved by the FDA for that immunization to be available. So there is no recommendation from the CDC that we have an immunization that's not available to us. So the FDA approves uh, immunizations, but the FDA does not set the guidelines on who gets to use them. That's set by the ACIP, which is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, a group that is advisory to the CDC. So the ACIP meets a couple of times a year, and they have a full agenda that's published online. They discuss those issues, and then they take votes or recommendations. And those recommendations then are forwarded to the CDC. So the ACIP looks at it first. They make a recommendation to the CDC, and the CDC then has to decide to accept those recommendations or not, and they're not official until the CDC publishes them in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, MMWR. So we have some recommendations from the ACIP for influenza this year that were from June of 2013, and they're in the process of being published in MMWR now. The ACIP just met again in the last couple of weeks, and again, if we see that, that'll probably be after the first of the year that the MMWR will publish that information. And it's also interesting, I give you some examples, that the FDA package inserts do not always correlate with the recommendations of the CDC. So the FDA and the CDC are not always on the same page. And I'll give you a good example. If you have a chronologically gifted patient who needs Zostavax vaccine and also needs Pneumovax, they're both, say they're 65 and they need to get both vaccines. The package insert and the FDA and the manufacturer say you should separate the doses by at least four weeks. They shouldn't be given together. So the Pneumovax vaccine and the Zostavax need to be separated according to the package insert that's mandated by the FDA and the manufacturer. And they cite a study that is a study with titers, suggesting the titers are reduced slightly when you use the combination and you administer them together, not separated by at least four weeks. Well, the ACIP has addressed this issue, and the CDC has addressed it, and their guidelines say you can give them together. You can give Zostavax concomitantly with Pneumovax on the same visit. And they use a study that was done by Kaiser of California. And most of the studies we have with immunizations are done by Kaiser in northern or southern California. 
That's where most of the data comes from. And their study suggests there's no difference in efficacy if the vaccines are given simultaneously versus four weeks apart. And they did a study to look at that. So the ACIP and CDC say you can give them together, but the package insert says not to do that, and the FDA mandated that wording in the package insert. So again, they're not always in sync. So we'll see that several times as we go through. So this was last year's ACIP meeting in October of 2012, and they recommended that pregnant women get a dose of Tdap with every pregnancy. And that again was new, and it was published in MMWR in February of 2013. So you can see the recommendation came out in October, and the CDC made it official in February. So women who are pregnant get a dose of Tdap during the third trimester of each pregnancy. So if they get pregnant four times over six years, they get four doses of Tdap over that six-year period. And the rationale for that is to boost maternal levels against pertussis. So that's why it's administered with each pregnancy. Because the person who's at risk for pertussis is that newborn. And we also have recommendations now that were changed about three years ago now. Used to be the uh, Tdap vaccine was only approved for patients 64 and younger. There is <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. There is now no upper age limit. So anybody independent of birthdays is a candidate for Tdap. And the recommendation is if you're going to be a grandparent and you're going to meet your new grandson or granddaughter, you need to be immunized at least two weeks before you meet that newborn. So at least two weeks before. So it's important for grandparents to be immunized with Tdap before they meet their new grandchildren. It's also important for all of us in healthcare that we get a dose of Tdap. And right now it's once and done. We don't know what the long-term surveillance will be. We could see boosters down the road, but right now we do not have recommendations for that. If we get a Tdap dose as an adult, then we get a TD or tetanus booster every 10 years thereafter, not a Tdap. But that could change, again, based on the surveillance and the recommendations from the ACIP and subsequently the CDC. So this was new uh, this year. Pregnant women get one dose of Tdap during the third trimester of each pregnancy. So they're the one group that gets multiple doses right now. This was just presented two weeks ago or a week ago at the ACIP meeting. We have data with flu zone high potency or high dose. This is the influenza vaccine that's FDA approved for adults 65 and older that is four times more concentrated than regular flu vaccine. And the reason the ACIP and CDC have not made a recommendation to prefer one versus another, they were waiting on the results of this trial. This is a 32,000 patient trial done in the US and Canada comparing regular flu zone versus high potency or high dose flu zone in patients 65 and older. And we now have the preliminary results. It has not been published yet. It's not been presented yet, but the data was made available to the ACIP at their meeting a week ago. So this is the first time this data has been made available to anybody. So two year trial. And basically, if you look at the laboratory rate of confirmed influenza, the high dose was 1.3%. 4.3% compared to 1.89% with the regular flu zone, that's a 24% greater efficacy. And the FDA had already preset there had to be at least a 9% greater efficacy to claim superiority in the label. So this again has not been submitted to the FDA yet, but they will have a label claim based on the guidance they received from the FDA when they did the study suggesting superiority with the high dose for patients 65 and older versus regular flu zone. So again, we don't know where this is going to go with the ACIP and CDC. We don't know where it's going to go with the FDA. This is the data that was reported at the ACIP last week. So brand new information, not published. You can't go online and find it except at the ACIP meeting. A couple of other changes in the last year that are important. 
This again was an FDA first. So Prevnar, the conjugated pneumococcal vaccine that we give for children, used to be Prevnar 7, it's now Prevnar 13. They added six additional strains that were not in the original Prevnar 7 because the Prevnar 7, those strains we saw decreased in invasive pneumococcal disease. They weren't causing disease anymore, and these strains were popping up in their place. So they expanded the vaccine from 7 to 13. And two of the strains in here are drug-resistant strains that are not in the Pneumovax 23. So there's a little bit of overlap, but there's also some non-overlap. So the FDA approved it in December of 2011 for adults age 50 and older. And at the time, the CDC had not made any position on it. The ACIP had not taken a position on it. And there are studies in underway to look at outcomes in patients over 50 as far as pneumonia risk. So those studies are still not available. I have not seen any of that data yet. Well, in June of 2012, the ACIP made a recommendation. And their recommendation was, and the vote was 14 to 0, that adults with AIDS, cancer, organ transplants, advanced kidney disease, or other immune-weakening conditions should be given pneumococcal vaccine Prevnar 13, including those who've already had Pneumovax 23. So both vaccines, and this is independent of age, because right now, Prevnar 13 is only approved for patients 50 and above. There is no age recommendation in this guideline from the ACIP. So if you're HIV positive, significant kidney disease, cancer, those kind of folks, independent of birthdays, get a dose of Prevnar 13 in addition to Pneumovax 23. So that was the recommendation from the ACIP. But again, not official until it's published in MMWR. So that occurred October of last year. So that recommendation was June. In October, it gets published. This is the guideline. So now that group is a candidate for Prevnar 13 in addition to Pneumovax 23. However, the guidelines are specific on which one to give first and the interval between the two vaccines. And this is where it's a little more difficult. You got to check it out before you do it. So if they've not had any pneumococcal vaccine, they're HIV positive, they got kidney disease, cancer, they're immunosuppressed, they get both vaccines, but you give the Prevnar, the conjugated vaccine, first. So the Prevnar 13, the conjugated vaccine, is more immunogenic. It stimulates the immune system better, and that's why it's approved for kids, where Pneumovax 23 does not work in children, Prevnar 13 does. So you give the conjugated vaccine first. Then, if you've given the conjugated vaccine first, you can then give them pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, the Pneumovax 23, at least eight weeks later. So there's an eight-week difference between the dose. If you start with the conjugated vaccine, then you can give the polysaccharide vaccine at least eight weeks later. Okay, so that is the, in the MMWR from last October. But if they've already been immunized with the polysaccharide vaccine, Pneumovax 23, you have to wait at least one year to give your dose of the conjugated pneumococcal vaccine. So if you give the conjugate vaccine first, it's at least eight weeks. And if you give the polysaccharide vaccine first, you got to wait at least a year. That's the recommendation in the guidelines from the MMWR last October. So again, it depends on which one you get first, and there's a significant separation either way, but one is at least eight weeks, the other is at least a year. That's the guidelines. Now, there is no booster dose currently for the conjugated vaccine, but if you give this patient, say at age 35, their conjugated vaccine first, at least eight weeks later, give them Pneumovax 23, there is a booster of Pneumovax five years later in the guidelines. So they get another dose of Pneumovax at age 40 if they got their first dose at age 35. They don't get a third dose until they're 65 years of age. So there could be three doses of the polysaccharide vaccine, but right now only one dose for adults 
with the conjugated vaccine. Does that make sense? So that is the guidelines as they stand today. Again, subject to change as we get more data over time, whether we'll need additional booster doses or whatever, that's where we are right now. So the pneumococcal vaccine for these high-risk patients is both. Now, when we get the results of the patients 50 and older, studies that are underway with the conjugated vaccine for pneumonia, this may change and it may open up to give both vaccines to lots more people than are currently recommended right now. So this is a moving target. All these things continue to evolve based on surveillance. Questions on the pneumococcal vaccines? And again, according to the CDC, if they're a candidate for Zostavax, you can give them both at the same time. Okay? So that's where we are with this one. This is also a moving target. This was uh, actually first published in 2011 by the American College of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology. And it said there's a very low risk of reaction to injection with the flu vaccines if you have a history of egg allergy. All the flu vaccines until this year were made in egg cell culture. Every flu vaccine we've ever had, the live attenuated, the intradermal, the high potency, the regular, they were all made in egg cell culture. This year, for the first time, we have two non-egg cell culture vaccines available. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But the recommendation back then was, based on eight trials, it didn't look like we had a lot of reactions in people with a history of egg allergy getting the injectable flu vaccine. And they recommended to give the whole cell, not the live attenuated, not the intradermal, not the high potency, the regular injectable flu vaccine in patients with a history of egg allergy. And if it's severe egg allergy, that it not be given in your grocery store, your pharmacy, it be given in a physician's office who is prepared and able to treat anaphylaxis should and if it occur. So that was a recommendation that was made back in 2011. So here is the June 21st, 2012, the ACIP meeting said, does not appear that modification affected the rate of allergic reactions according to the VAERS system. VAERS is a vaccine adverse event reporting system that the CDC, the FDA collaborate on. So they looked at the first year's worth of data, people with a history of egg allergy who got the injectable vaccine and said, we haven't seen any significant spike in adverse reactions. So continue to give the vaccine. So they actually had a protocol that said for low-risk patients, you could get any of the injectable flu vaccines. For high-risk people, still need to be done in a physician's office prepared to treat anaphylaxis should and if it occur, because they didn't have any alternatives. Well, in June 20 of this year, the ACIP recommended a specific new vaccine. Protein sciences developed FluBlock. FluBlock is a recombinant DNA technology that uses the fall armyworm to manufacture influenza vaccine. There is no egg in the development process from day one. So there is no possibility of egg protein in this vaccine. So FluBlock is now the, the CDC recommended vaccine for people with a history of severe egg allergy. If they have minor egg allergy, the regular injectable vaccine made in egg cell culture is still okay. The reason we're concerned about flu block is that flu block is more expensive and has a very short shelf life once you get it. It's only good for 16 weeks. The expiration date is 16 weeks. Okay, all the other flu vaccines except flu block have the same expiration date every year. June 30 of 2014 is the expiration date on every other flu vaccine you have in your office. Whether it's live attenuated, the intradermal, the high potency, the injectable, trivalent, quadrivalent, they all have a specified expiration date of June 30 of the year after they were put on the market. So for 2013, all the vaccines we have now all expire June 30 except for flu block. And flu block is 16 weeks, okay? So another piece of information we need to be aware of. So this is their recommendation, vote of 13 to 0. And again, this was in June, but
but the MMWR has still not yet published it to my knowledge. Now, a couple of other things that are new for this year. We changed the terminology that CDC is using for the flu vaccines, and we now have seven vaccines to choose from when we select a flu vaccine. Seven. Okay, so some of the things that were new this year. All the vaccines until this year have always been trivalent. Two A strains, one B strain of influenza. And those strains are set by the CDC, the World Health Organization. They set the strains that we have in the vaccines and the manufacturers make the, man, uh, the vaccine based on those recommendations from the CDC, MNWR, all that data is out there. For this year, for the first time, we have a couple of vaccines that are not trivalent, they're quadrivalent, 2A and 2B strains. And the second B strain is also specified by the CDC and World Health Organization. The first one to be approved and the only vaccine that is only quadrivalent this year is the live attenuated, the flu mist. Flu mist this year is only quadrivalent. The FDA approved it before they manufactured the vaccine for this year, so all the vaccine they manufacture is quadrivalent, 2A and 2B strain. And again, there is no recommendation to prefer one versus the other. And flu mist is only FDA approved for patients age 2 through 49. Not above age 49, not below age 2, and not in people with risk factors. Normal, healthy people. That's the live attenuated flu vaccine. And this year, it's all quadrivalent. We have two that may or may not be quadrivalent depending on what you get. Fluzone by Sanofi and Fluorix by GSK are both trivalent or quadrivalent because they were approved after the manufacturing process started for both these vaccines. So the manufacturer could not market the quadrivalent unless it got FDA approved. So they still had to have trivalent available in their production facilities. So they're now both FDA approved, and depending on what you get, it will say on the box or the label, trivalent or quadrivalent. So Fluzone can be trivalent or quadrivalent this year, and Fluorix can be trivalent or quadrivalent this year. And again, there's no recommendation for one versus the other. It's just with the quadrivalent, you get a second B strain of influenza added to the vaccine. Now, next year, those two companies will only market a quadrivalent vaccine. They will now no longer market a trivalent. Okay? The only reason they're both there this year is the approval took place after the production was already started, and they weren't sure the FDA was going to approve their quadrivalent. And if they hadn't approved it, they couldn't market it. They would have only been able to market the trivalent, so they had both in production. So that's another change for this year. Now, here is the quadrivalent ones, and the flu mist is age 2 to 49, as I mentioned. GSK Fluorix is age 3 and up. So age 3 and up is the GSK indication, and flu zone, quadrivalent or trivalent, is the only one that goes down to 6 months of age. The only flu vaccine that is indicated down to 6 months is flu zone and you can use either the trivalent or quadrivalent strains, okay? So flu zone's the only one that goes to six months. We have another non-egg cell culture produced vaccine called flu cell vax by Novartis. And this one is actually made in the dog kidney cell. So flu cell vax is also available this year and both these new ones, flu block and flu cell vax, are trivalent, not quadrivalent. Lots of different flu vaccines to choose from. Now, one of the reasons the ACIP did not select flu cell vax for egg allergy, the original strains of influenza virus used in these dog kidney cells come from egg cell culture, where they don't for flu block. That's the only difference. So again, it's low risk, but they did not specifically recommend flu cell vax for egg allergy, severe egg allergy, they recommend flu block. And flu cell vax has got the standard expiration date, where flu block does not. So this year, what used to be called TIV 
is now IIV3 or IIV4, either inactivated influenza virus trivalent or inactivated influenza virus quadrivalent. So IIV3 or IIV4. The high dose is still trivalent only this year, four times more concentrated. And again, we don't have a recommendation for that. Interdermal this year is still IIV3, trivalent, not quadrivalent. So fluzone interdermal is age 18 to 64, interdermal administration, not for kids and not above age 64. So the only vaccine that goes from six months and no upper age limit is fluzone, the regular injectable. That's the only one that has that breadth at this point in time. So these are the ones you have to choose from. And this is the flu cell vax by Novartis made in the Mandarin Darby kidney cell. So again, it's cell culture manufactured and it's for 18 and older. There is no data currently under 18 years of age for flu cell vax. So it's 18 and older is what's in their label. And then flu block is for 18 through 49. Again, there's no data yet in kids. Both these drugs are being studied in children, but there is no data yet. So the FDA limit is 18 to 49 for this one, and the other one's 18 and above. And this one's also being studied above 49, but again, no data yet. The data that got it approved is with these age ranges. So we don't have the experience yet. So that's why it's limited. And the CDC is recommending we follow the age recommendations in the label for these drugs since we do have six months and no upper limit, depending on which vaccine you have. So that's kind of where we are with the influenza vaccine. More complicated than ever. Seven choices when you choose a vaccine this year. Questions on the flu vaccines? That's new this year. A couple of other things just to update you that are in the process of changing. Back in January of 2011, the FDA put all the manufacturers of opioid Tylenol combination products like Vicodin, Lortab, these combinations, on notice they could no longer include acetaminophen doses greater than 325 milligrams per dosage unit. So if you look at the old Vicodin, and I've got a slide that shows you, the old Vicodin was 5 milligram, the lowest hydrocodone tablet, with 500. And the new formulation is 5 slash 300. Old Vicodin ES that was 7.5 of hydrocodone was 7.5 slash 750. It'll now be 7.5 slash 300. And the high potency 10 milligram dose had 660 milligrams of Tylenol per tablet. It's now down to 300. So the maximum the FDA is going to allow on any combination product is 325 milligrams. And that's all combinations, whether it's oxycodone, hydrocodone, you name it, any opioid combination, no more than 325 milligrams per dose. And that is implemented, the hard cutoff date is January of 2014. So most of the manufacturers already discontinued manufacturing the combinations with more than 325. And what's interesting, AbbVie or the old Abbott, why do you think they used 300 instead of 325? It's all about the dollars. All about the dollars. Because a generic could be hydrocodone with 325, that's not substitutable for a 300. If you write Vicodin and it only has 300 milligrams, you can't substitute with 325 of acetaminophen. So the good news is Watson and several other generics have marketed both a 300 and 325. So there are generics to Vicodin, but most of the, most of the combinations are going to be 325, five grains, because that's the way we normally think of it. So the only reason they marketed a 300 is for the money because you can't substitute 325 is not equivalent to 300. There has to be the same active ingredient in the same dose in the same dosage form. So if there's a milligram difference in the dose, it's not substitutable. So that's the rationale for that issue. I can't imagine 25 milligrams is going to make a difference clinically, but that's the law. 
So this one is where we are with this one. Now, hydrocodone acetaminophen is the number one prescribed drug in the world. In the United States, here's the last five years, 2008, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And these are number, by number of prescriptions written, 135.3 million prescriptions for hydrocodone acetaminophen in the United States last year. Number one drug, and you can see levothyroxine is almost 30 million prescriptions less, and that's a combination of all levothyroxines together. So it's the number one drug for the last almost 10 years. There's enough hydrocodone acetaminophen written for every adult in this country to have a month's supply every year. Number one prescribed drug. Now, this is changing. This was just announced again last week by the FDA commissioner. By early December, the FDA plans to submit our formal recommendation package to Health and Human Services to reclassify hydrocodone combination products into Schedule II. We anticipate the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, will concur with our recommendation. This will begin a process that will lead to final decision by the DEA on the appropriate scheduling of these products. And the DEA has already said they're supportive of moving hydrocodone to Schedule II, which means no refills, no telephone prescription unless it's an emergency period. This is going to be treated just like morphine, oxycodone, Schedule II. The only way you can get three months' supply is like you can now. You write a prescription and you give them three prescriptions because only a 30-day supply per prescription without refill. And you date all three the day you wrote them. And on the second, we say, don't fill before a 30-day date. On the third, when you say, don't fill before a 60-day date, and you give the patient three signed prescriptions, all dated the same day for a one-month supply. That's what you can do right now for all Schedule twos. That's the only way you're going to get more than a one-month supply of hydrocodone-containing products in the future. And this will probably be implemented early 2014. So it's on the way. And I don't think there's any stopping it. Because the FDA has had enough. Their advisory committee has recommended it go that way. The DEA asked the FDA about it three years ago because they wanted to move it. So I don't think there's going to be any major hiccup in moving hydrocodone-containing products to Schedule II. Now, as I say that, the FDA also approved last week, two days later, the FDA approved the first extended release hydrocodone single entity product without acetaminophen. And they approved it already as Schedule II. So this one is Zyhydro ER. And basically, it's 10, 20, 40, 50 milligram Q12 hour dosage form, 12 hour dosage form of hydrocodone, extended release hydrocodone for patients who have severe pain enough to require daily around the clock long term treatment for which alternative treatment options are inadequate. It's the first single entity extended release hydrocodone product approved by the FDA. And they approved it as a C2. Now, this is the, it's not approved for as needed pain relief, and that's now going to be a new label requirement for all sustained release or long-acting opioids. Long-acting opioids, methadone, oxycontin, oxycodone, those guys that are controlled release, sustained release, long-acting, none of them are going to be approved for PRN, pain relief, rescue pain. Only for those patients who have a need for chronic long-term opioids. Okay? So not for as needed. And this new label requirement was posted by the FDA on their website September the 10th of this year. So, and I'll show you what the new labeling requirements are because Zyhydro ER meets the new labeling requirements. The only FDA approved drug that already has incorporated all the labeling requirements set forth by the FDA in September. So here's the 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, and 50 milligram capsules. They cannot be chewed. They must be swallowed whole. Can't be crushed. You can't take them out and dump the granules. 
you have to swallow the, ca uh, the capsules whole. And for opioid naive patients, non-tolerant patients, 10 milligrams every 12 hours is your starting dose. Nobody starts more than 10 milligrams Q12, even though they've got a 15, 20, 30, 40, and 50 milligram dosing form. You start at 10 Q12. You increase the dose in 10 milligram increments every 12 hours, every three to seven days, depending on patient's response, side effects, and efficacy. That is now mandated in the label, and that's one of the things that has to be in all the labels of long-acting extended release products of opioids from now on. So this is the first one that has all that built into it. It also has a box warning, and the box warning has four different areas mandated, and this one has all four in their box. One relates to addiction, abuse, and misuse can lead to overdose and death, so that's class warning. Serious, life-threatening, or fatal respiratory depression may occur. Monitor closely, especially upon initiation of therapy or dose increase. That's a box warning that all are going to have. Accidental consumption of whatever this opioid is, because it just says trade name in the recommendations, especially children can result in fatal overdoses. That's new. And then patients who require, while pregnant, be aware that infants may require treatment for opioid uh, withdrawal syndrome, so NOW, neonatal opioid withdrawal. Prolonged use can result in life-threatening neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. That's now class labeling for all long-acting extended release opioids. And if there's an interaction with alcohol, that has to be in the box as well. And that one's not in all of them, but it is for selected ones. So those all have to be on the label for all long-acting or extended release opioids. The new indication and usage is the same for all of them. It's going to be uh, standardized. This drug is indicated for the management of pain severe enough to require daily around the clock long-term opioid treatment for which alternative treatment options are inadequate and it is not indicated as an as-needed PRN analgesic. That will be class labeling for all these drugs as well. These were mandated by the FDA in September of this year, and this is the first drug to have them. Limitations of use. Patients for whom alternative treatment options, non-opioid analgesics, immediate release opioids are ineffective, not tolerated, or would otherwise be inadequate to provide sufficient management of pain is a limitation of use for all these agents as well. And they also give dose and administration. These are required if you have the data. For opioid naive and opioid non-tolerant patients, start with, you saw the uh, Zahydro, 10 milligrams, Q12 hours. So that's mandated. All of them will have that. If it's a once a day formulation, it'll say every 24 hours. To convert to a different opioid, use available conversion factors of, to obtain estimated dose, and they include a conversion table. So there's a conversion table with the Zyhydro ER hydrocodone in the package insert. If you're changing to morphine, methadone, or from, all those things are listed. Specific recommendations of the Tyration Scream are available. Include the following bullet. Dose can be increased every X to X days using increments of X every X hours. So again, all those are mandated in the labeling for all these opioids for the future. It's also requiring all the manufacturers of all long-acting or sustained release opioids to do trials to look at post-marketing requirements to assess the risk of abuse, misuse, increased sensitivity to pain, addiction, overdose, and death. That has all been mandated for every one of these manufacturers for the future. So all these took effect in September of 2013 when the FDA announced these are our new requirements for all these drugs. And you'll see in a minute why the FDA is doing this. This is data from the CDC. There are 40 people in the United States that die every day from prescription pain killer abuse. There are more people who die from these medications than the risk of dying in a traffic accident. 
and its prescribed drugs. We're not talking about illegal drug use. I can give you at least seven or eight cases that I've been asked to review in the last two years of physicians who are being sued because of accidental death due to these drugs and not intentional overdoses. It's happening more and more. And that's one of the reasons the FDA is so concerned. And we have lots of illegitimate use as well. So this was since 2009, you're more at risk of dying of a prescription drug overdose than you are of a traffic accident. One of the things that's telling is this study from California. California study found that 3% of physicians wrote 62% of all opioid prescriptions. These are the prescription drug mill people. These are the people that now the pharmacies that are filling these prescriptions are being uh, co-opted by the DEA and the state agencies to provide that information on who's writing all these prescriptions that you're filling. And they are starting to go after these drug mills. And that, to my mind, is not a bad thing. It needs to happen. There are people out there that just write these prescriptions for anybody. You come in, you pay me a fee, you can go out the back door with your prescription. And then they stop along I-95 from they're coming from Florida and get them filled. And now the DEA and the uh, FDA are closing down some pharmacies because they have dispensed so many of these controlled substances. We're talking about millions of pills in one pharmacy for hydrocodone and oxycodone. And when you go to the wholesaler, the wholesaler has got a red flag saying, this pharmacy is using this stuff by the truckload. They can't keep it in stock. Why can't they keep it in stock? Because they have these prescription mills in their area and people are flocking there to fill their prescriptions. So all that stuff is now coming to roost. This is a huge problem that's not going away, and right now, every agency involved is trying to shut this stuff down. It's not that we don't want to be able to use these drugs for people who need them. That's not the problem. The problem is the people who abuse the system, and then the other problem is that even people who need them, a lot of times, we don't know what we're doing when we write these prescriptions. We don't know how to dose these drugs. That's what gets us in trouble as well. And I'll give you some examples of that in just a minute. So here is informed consent for opioid management. When starting chronic opioid therapy, COT, informed consent should be obtained. With written management plan to document patient and clinician responsibilities and expectations. A pain contract, if you will. This is from the Journal of Pain in 2009, and they have some example pain contracts that we'd refer you to. And basically they say components should include all control substances must be prescribed by the physician whose signature appears below unless a specific exception is authorized. So we have one physician in the practice who manages that patient's opioid therapy. If that physician doesn't write it, nobody else can write it in that practice. Okay, without the authorization of the person who signed the pain contract. It also must be obtained at the same pharmacy which is specifically listed in the agreement. What pharmacy are you going to use? Okay, we don't want you going to different pharmacies when they don't know what you're getting. You must inform us any new medication or medication medical conditions. Prescribing physician has permission to discuss all diagnostic and treatment details with the dispensing pharmacist or other health professionals and responsible legal authorities in the contract. You may not share or otherwise permit others to have access to these medications. They should not be stopped abruptly. Unannounced urine or serum drug screens may be requested. You will protect and safeguard these medications to reduce the risk of access by others. You will bring to the office in each visit the original medication containers. You will keep medication out of the reach of children and others, including your dogs and cats. Medications may not be replaced if they're lost, get wet, stolen, or destroyed. Early refills will generally not be given. Prescriptions may be issued early when you go out of town when a refill is due, but not prior to a specified date. 
Failure to adhere to these policies may result in cessation of therapy. I will no longer treat you. Renewals are contingent upon keeping scheduled appointments. Do not phone in for refills after hours on weekends. Consider using multiples of seven, not a 30-day supply, but multiples of seven so it's the same day that you run out. So you run out on a Wednesday every month. It's when it's due, or a Thursday, but not multiples of 30, multiples of seven. Makes sense when you think about it. Any treatment is initiated as a trial, and that continued prescription is contingent upon continued benefit. You've got to assess and document your assessment in their record. Conversion charts are only a guide that you still get us into trouble. And the two that get us in most trouble with conversion are fentanyl patches and methadone. Those conversion charts are not great. And in general, whatever the conversion is, cut it in half if the patient is doing okay, just to be safe rather than sorry. So it'd be cautious, decrease the dose by about 50% if the patient has good pain control. Tolerance is not automatic with one drug when you switch to another, especially with methadone. So somebody who's being switched to methadone who's been on oxycodone, morphine, even though they have high tolerance on the oxycodone or methadone, uh, morphine, you switch to methadone, the tolerance may not be there at all. So if you use an equivalent dose, you can put them in respiratory depression, QT prolongation, death. That's where we get into trouble all the time. Caution patients not to take the next scheduled dose if they have signs of toxicity, especially confusion or excess sedation. The one thing side effect we always talk about is constipation. And we put them on an opioid constipation regimen with a uh, stool softener and a stimulant laxative. That's automatic. But that's not what kills people, respiratory depression. So if they are poorly arousable, increased snoring, those kind of things, those are red flags, they're getting too much opioid. And we don't want to increase the dose even if they're having pain because we're going to depress their respiration and that's where the deaths come. And if it's methadone, you're going to get QT prolongation, get a fatal arrhythmia potentially. All those things are there with these guys. We have to pay attention. Avoid meparity. It's on my list of drugs I wouldn't give to my dog. Love my dog. It's a short-acting opioid. It lasts less than three hours for pain relief. Has terrible poor oral bioavailability. More euphoria than the other opioids. And has a toxic metabolite, nor meparity, that hangs around a lot longer and it's renally eliminated. And as it accumulates, it's a CNS stimulant, and it can lower your seizure threshold. And I've been involved as an expert in a case for one of our local hospitals where they used a meparidine drip post-orthopedic surgery to a guy who had chronic back pain. He'd been on Meprogan Forte for several months before he came in. So they used meparidine. He didn't have impaired kidney function. But during post-op, he had a massive seizure and actually fractured both of his shoulders from the seizure, okay? And he didn't have impaired kidney function, but it was due to the norma paradine that accumulated in this guy. There is no reason to use that drug. I wouldn't give it to my dog, so be careful with that one. Methadone is a wonderful drug, but if you don't know what you're doing with it, it gets you into trouble real quick. This one's got a different pharmacokinetic profile that is not ideal at all. It's a synthetic mu receptor agonist as well as an NMDA receptor antagonist. So it makes it especially beneficial in people with chronic pain and neuropathic pain due to the NMDA receptor blocking activity. But its duration as an analgesic for pain activity is only about three to six hours. And over time, it accumulates, and you get 8 to 12-hour duration. But early on, it's short-acting as far as a analgesic for pain relief. It's much less expensive. It's inexpensive. But its pharmacokinetics is really a problem. This is a recommendation from the American Pain Society. Characterized by complicated and variable pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and should be initiated and titrated cautiously by clinicians familiar with its use and risk. 
strong recommendation, moderate quality evidence. A number of epidemiologic studies suggest an increased rate of methadone deaths, not only respiratory depression, but QT prolongation. So if they've got a low potassium, low magnesium, they're on proton pump inhibitors, they're on antiarrhythmics, they're on tricyclic antidepressants for pain, all those things increase the risk of QT prolongation. They're on fluoroquinolones, especially moxifloxacin, Avalox, QT prolongation. They're on erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, zithromax, increased QTC intervals, increased risk with methadone. So we have to watch out for those kind of interactions. Its half-life is variable, but when you look at the data, some people have half-life of methadone of 100 to 120 hours. Yet the duration of analgesic activity early on is only three to six hours. So if you increase the dose to cover the pain relief, what are you doing long term to the levels of the drug? It's going up, 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 and up. And that's where we get into trouble. Because as those levels go up, the respiratory depression gets worse, the QT interval gets longer, you put them at risk for bad outcomes. So it is a very, very difficult drug to use from that standpoint. But over time, it induces its own metabolism. So the half-life comes down over time. But acutely, it's got a very long half-life. All those are things that complicate its use. The starting dose for most opioid and knee patients is 2.5 milligrams every 8 hours, according to the American Pain Society. With dose increases, no more frequently than weekly because it takes that long, early on with a long half-life drug, to begin to reach steady state. So we don't want to bump the dose too quickly. That's where we get into trouble. The panel recommends methadone not be used to treat breakthrough pain or as an ad-needed medication, only for chronic pain and add something else for breakthrough. That's what the American Pain Society recommends. We don't use additional doses of methadone for breakthrough pain even though it's been used that way for years. They also say starting dose should generally not exceed 30 to 40 a day, even in patients on high-dose opioids. If you're converting from morphine or oxycodone to methadone, don't use more than 30 to 40 milligrams total daily dose of methadone, even in people who have a high tolerance to the other opioids, because there may not be cross-tolerance with methadone. And that's where we get into trouble again. And again, caution patients or family members to look for signs of overdose, impaired arousability, increased snoring. Those kind of things are red flags that we don't want to push the dose. We want to back off if we see those kind of things, not increase it. So all those are issues when it comes to this drug. And you've got some uh, recommendations on some of the dosing equivalents there at the bottom. Last thing on the opioids, this is 10 steps for universal precautions in pain medicine, again by the American Pain Society. Make a diagnosis with appropriate differential following a comprehensive evaluation. It's not just a two-minute consultation. Psychological assessment, including risk for addictive disorders and stratification, behavioral uh, disorders, substance abuse disorders, all those need to be part of your evaluation need an informed consent and a treatment agreement. Pre- and post-test intervention assessment and pain level and function have to be assessed on a regular basis. How is the patient doing? How's their pain relief? What is their level of function? Appropriate trial of opioid therapy with or without adjunctive medication. If they've got bone pain, they probably need an NSAID in addition. So there are lots of things that we need to think about depending on what we're treating. Reassess the pain score and level of function again on an ongoing basis. Regularly assess, they call the A's of pain medicine. Analgesia, activities of daily living, adverse side effects, aberrant drug taking behaviors, adherence and affect. Observed mood may also be added to that. These are all things we need to do and document that we're assessing in these patients on an ongoing basis. Use. Uh, Drug screens, both serum and urine drug screening. Periodically review the diagnosis, comorbid conditions, including addictive disorders, and make sure you document everything. That's the only way to cover yourself 
and to make sure you're doing the best you can for your patient for that doctor-patient relationship. These are all parts of what good pain management requires. And this is, I believe, the standard, and nobody in the government doesn't want you to not use the drug in somebody who needs it. But if you need it, you need to know what you're doing, how to do it, and document and monitor. That's the key to safety with these drugs. Those are all important pieces of it. Questions on the opioid stuff? There's lots of, yes, sir. For what? Yes. Basically, all it does is you won't be able to use more than a 30-day pres uh, prescription per patient, and you can give them up to three prescriptions. And you can't call it in. If you call it in as an emergency prescription, you have to have, within 72 hours, that pharmacy has to have on file a written prescription by you for that drug for that patient. If it's an emergency prescription, pharmacists can give them the drug as an emergency, but you have to, by law, give them that written prescription within 72 hours. They have to physically have it. Whether the patient, the family, or you get it there, it doesn't matter, but they need to have a written prescription on file. If they don't, they contact the drug enforcement people in their state, and they're going to come after you, not the pharmacist. Because the pharmacist, if they go in and are audited by the DEA or one of the the drug enforcement agencies in your state, and they don't have a written prescription signed by you, they just have an emergency prescription they've recorded, and they don't have a hard copy within 72 hours, they're coming after you, not the pharmacist. And the pharmacist has to notify the drug people in your state that that has not happened. That's a requirement for all C2s, and that's what's getting ready to happen for hydrocodone. Why pharmacists are not happy, why patient groups are not happy, because that's the way it's going to be. It puts additional hurdles on hydrocodone. We can still get it, and the only way to give them more than a month's supply is to handwrite three prescriptions, all dated the day you write the prescription, and don't fill the second one before 30 days after the first one's written. You can't fill the third one until 60 days after the first one was written. That's the only way you can give more than a one-month supply. And the pharmacist cannot dispense more than one month at a time. Or 100 doses, depends on what your state is. But the federal regs are no more than a one-month supply of any of these C2 drugs with no refills. That's the way it goes. And if you've heard on the TV, a lot of the news people say, well, you can give up to three-month supply. The only way to give a three-month supply is those three written prescriptions on the day it's originally written. It's no refills. You can't say refill times three, no. You can't refill, no refills. And again, they need to be written on tamper-proof paper, all that kind of stuff that's now out there. All those things apply to all these drugs, all your controlled substances. Some states had already moved hydrocodone, like New York, had moved hydrocodone to Schedule II already. States can make more restrictions than the feds, but not less. So the federal regulation, when you go to C2, we don't have a choice. States have no choice. It'll all be C2. Right now, states have a choice to move hydrocodone to C2 on their own because it's more restrictive than the federal legislation. It cannot be less than the federal legislation. Does that make sense? That's kind of where we are. Yes, sir. He's going to bring you a microphone. Uh, just uh, an observation from my practice as a sleep specialist is these patients, chronic pain patients, often come in with just spectacular polypharmacy. In the office, they don't particularly look somnolent, but you study them in the lab with capnometry, which measures exhaled carbon dioxide. It's very close to arterial CO2. A lot of these patients will not have apneas, but will be hypoxic for most of the night and have very high end tidal CO2s, and they're basically hypoventilating because their cortex isn't driving their respiration, just their, their marinated brain stem. Um, from all these narcotics, and you, you tell them post after the test that you, you're, you're going to die because you don't breathe at night because you're so uh, strung out on medications, and they still give you a fight about wanting to not stop any of the medicines. Yep, and but the other medications they're mainly on, alprazolam or benzodiazepines, are almost always in the mix with these drugs, yeah. and they're additive. Alcohol is usually in the mix as well, and it's additive as well. And, and they don't look particularly medicated when you see them in the office. 
in the back there. If a, if a pharmacist fills a prescription as an emergency, are you allowed to fax in a hard copy, or do you have to have it on the Depends on your state. The state laws, whatever your, our state does not allow you to fax it. So how do you get the hard copy to the pharmacist? Either send it to them or have somebody take it to them. They have to have an original signed prescription. And some states allow faxing, others do not. And hopefully that will change. We would like to see all the states have similar, but each state board of pharmacy determines their practice and their state. And the uh, Department of Health and Human Services in the state, they have a drug enforcement division as well. They're also involved in those decisions with controlled substances, independent of the DEA. They cannot be less restrictive, but can be more restrictive. Again, that's the way the state laws are written. Question over here. Yes. Um, so I'm in a practice where there's just a couple docs who have panels and um, they prescribe narcotics you know, for chronic pain. And there are times when they're gone on vacation or see me or whatever, and I get you know, a request filled 240 dilaudid. I mean, I actually had this happen. I, and I'm very uncomfortable to do it. I don't know the patient. I have no established you know, relationship with them. Uh, sometimes the documentation is not very clear about why they're getting such high doses of narcotics. How do you, uh, I guess I'm asking for suggestions on how do I handle a situation like that and not be considered difficult by the nursing staff or pharmacy. What I would do is make sure that your partners or the people you're covering for when they're out of town let you know who these patients are ahead of time so you can feel comfortable. This is what I'm doing and why. This is my documentation. This is real. Because if you don't do that and you're uncomfortable and then it's proven wrong, that partner of yours is putting you in a position you don't want to be in. And in, they wouldn't want to be in if they were in your shoes. So I think it's important we have to communicate. That communication is key. And again, if I have that pain document signed, they can share that with you and let you know, this is this patient, this is what he's on, this is why, and if he calls while I'm out, not here, and you're covering for me, you need to know this and this is what we're going to do. It's important to do that. And hopefully you don't have a lot of those kind of patients. If you do, then there's red flags everywhere that you have a partner that might be contributing to the problem, not necessarily just treating patients who have a high need. All those are things that we need to think about. And those things happen. There are people in pharmacies and in practices today, their partners have no idea what they're doing, and they are doing things for the wrong reason. And we see reports of this come out time and time again. I had a, was on a program here about six months ago where we had a former uh, inspector for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation who worked out of Atlanta and told us stories of what they found in pharmacies and physician practices, what was going on, and how patients were abusing the system and the physicians and pharmacists that had bought into that system. She had story after story, and they'd go in and catch these people and arrest them, and they need help. They really do. It is a, it's an ongoing problem. That's why all these regulations are coming forward now. This is an attempt to try and minimize that risk. But at the same time, we have to make sure that patients who really need it can still get it. That's the concern. We don't want to turn all these drugs off. There's a need for these drugs, so we don't have good alternatives to them. For those patients that are terminally ill, those who have chronic conditions that require chronic opioid therapy. And again, the guidelines say there's still a need for it, but we have to be careful, and we need to do it the right way for the right reason, and monitor and document it. All that's the issue. Yes? Uh, corollary problem with what had just recently been said is you have your own primary care patients that you have referred to a pain clinic. They've made a contract with the pain clinic that they will not seek medications outside that office, and yet Friday at 4.30 they frequently call your office saying, I can't get a hold of the pain clinic, the doctor's not available, and I need my medicine. Okay. That's a violation of the contract, and you should not 
fill that prescription, you should try and get in touch with that pain clinic or that pain doctor, let them know that's happening because they may not have any idea that's happening at all. All those things are where we need to communicate with each other. If that's the case, we are not in the business of giving you your pain medication. If I have a signed contract and I only get it from this pain clinic, then I don't want to break that contract for you. I don't want to cause you to lose care for that because that's a, I've broken the contract if I do that and that pain clinic may dismiss you. You don't want me to do that. All those are things that I have to do and then I make it a point to try and contact somebody in that pain clinic to let them know this is what's happening. And I am not going to be the one that breaks your contract. I'll just point out that a lot of the third party payers are locking in patients to specific pharmacies and physicians. Uh, that will help us. Yes, it will. Everybody heard that. So third party payers are now getting into this business as well, locking patients in. And one of the things that's going to help is all the states have controlled substance tracking systems. The problem is that some of those states require the pharmacist has to enter it within 30 days after it's filled. So we don't know that they got it filled today. We may not get into the system, so we check the system and we don't see they got it anywhere else. That's all becoming more on time, live, real time, entering the data. That's where we've got to move to just like we do for the, uh, the pseudoephedrine, where they, all the pharmacies now, they have to log it in, and we're beginning to see tracking systems for that, live time, real time. Individual pharmacies may do it, so all the Walgreens know if you've got it, or the CVSs, but everybody else may not. So that's where we need to go. Those real time, live tracking systems will help make a difference because you can go in and see if they've got it anywhere. On what date and what drugs they got, who wrote them, so if they're doctor shopping, all that stuff's available, and that's one of the things the drug enforcement people are starting to look at. So we're getting more of that, but it's still not where it needs to be. It needs to be real time when they go in, as soon as it's filled, it shows up. They got this prescription, this drug, and this amount, on this date from this pharmacy written by this physician. All that data is there, but it's not real time right now in a lot of states. It is in some states, but most states it's not. Okay? Since our time's getting away from me, what else do you want to talk about? There's lots of stuff in here. There's new stuff on diabetes that's not on your conference schedule. There's several new drugs. You've got new alternatives to warfarin. Lots of stuff that's in here. Huh? Xarelto, okay. Xarelto is the newest or second newest of the anti 10A. Xarelto is River Roxaban. Xaban is in a generic name for River Roxaban and Apixaban. And what that means is 10A inhibitor. So it's one of the drug generic names that makes sense. Exaban is in the end, Doxaban's coming. It's another 10A inhibitor. So any drug you see that has XA ban in its stem is a 10A inhibitor. It's an alternative to warfarin. Faster onset, and right now all the alternatives to warfarin are renally eliminated. So there's renal dosing adjustment with all these guys where there's not with warfarin. Okay, so for renal dysfunction, warfarin is still our drug of choice. Let me show you if I can get to it real quick. Rivaroxaban. It's got four FDA approved indications. The first indication was for hip and knee surgery prophylaxis. Four studies, record one, two, three, and four, hip and knee replacement surgery versus low molecular heparin, Lovenox, anoxaparin. It was superior to anoxaparin in all of it. Was, they were all designed as non-inferiority trials. If it met non-inferiority, then they looked for superiority and it met it in all of them. So it's actually better than anoxaparin at reducing DVT risk for both hip replacement and knee replacement. The FDA approved dose for this drug is 10 milligrams once a day with or without food. It's the only dose that you don't have to take with food. The 15 and 20 milligram dose require food, not the 10. 
and for hip replacement, it's once a day for 35 days, and for knee replacement, it's once a day for 12 days. That's the FDA approved dose for hip and knee surgical replacement. 12 days for knee, 35 days for hip, and then you can stop it. So it's short term, once a day, with or without food. This is the indication that it came out with second, non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And right now we have dabigatran, prodaxa, apixaban, eliquis, and rivaroxaban, xarelto, all approved for this indication. So all three of the new guys have this indication. Non-valvular atrial fibrillation to reduce your risk of stroke and systemic embolization. All three of these new drugs have the same study design to get them approved. One large clinical trial, in this case, you're looking at uh, over 14,000 patients. The Bigatran Prodax was 18,000, and so was Apixaban Eliquis, 18,000 patients. They're all versus adjusted dose warfarin, no placebo control. Warfarin is the drug of choice for people with non-valvular non AFib who have a CHADS-2 score of two or greater. This one, the baseline CHADS-2 score in both arms is 2.1. I'm sorry, this one's 3.5. Rely and Apixaban's data are 2.1. This is 3.5. And it's adjusted dose warfarin versus one of two doses of Apixaban based on, uh, or Viroxaban based on renal function. So if you look at the primary endpoint as non-inferiority, it met that endpoint and the number needed to treat in favor of rivaroxaban better than warfarin, all comers, is 222. For every 222 patients treated for almost two years, you had one less stroke or embolization with rivaroxaban versus warfarin. And if you looked at primary endpoint at intent to treat, which is what the FDA requires for superiority, it doesn't meet it. So it's not inferior, but it does not meet the requirement for superiority. Where dabigatran, prodaxin, rely is superior intent to treat, and so is apixaban, eliquis, in the Aristotle trial. So this one does not have a claim. It's superior to warfarin. It's equal to warfarin in its label. Minor differences. I don't think there's a major difference among the three personally. So vascular death, stroke, and embolization does show significant reduction. Number to treat 193. Hemorrhagic stroke is reduced by almost 50%, but the number need treats 556 to have one less hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke, unknown stroke, no difference. Bleeding, major bleeding and non-major bleeding, no significant difference. They're the same. Major bleeding, no difference. Bleeding that dropped your hemoglobin more than two grams per deciliter, it's in favor of warfarin. Number needed to harm with river oxbands 197. Transfusion is in favor of warfarin. Number needed to harm 304. Critical organ bleeding is the other way, in favor of river oxaban 278. Bleeding causing death, river oxbands wins, but the number needed treats 455. So not a lot of difference in the bleeding risk at all with the drug. Intracranial hemorrhage, you got to treat 400 to have one less with river oxaban versus warfarin. Here's how it's dosed. For non valvular AFib, it's a 20 milligram dose with normal renal function, creatinine clearance greater than 50, with the evening meal. You have to take it with food because the bioavailability is significantly impaired if you don't take it with food. Not true for the 10 milligram, but is for 15 and 20. So the label says, as it was done in the trial, with the evening meal. If they got a creatinine clearance of 15 to less than 50, it's 15 milligrams once a day with the evening meal. Not to be used with a creatinine clearance less than 15 in its label. Okay, and there's the bioavailability data. So it's once a day for non vavor AFib, 15 or 20 milligrams with the evening meal. And you don't have to monitor the INR or activated partial thromboplastin time. And if you do, it's going to be prolonged, but it's not predictive of the level of anticoagulation. Okay? Now, 
This one also has a box warning. Discontinuing Xarelto places patients at increased risk of thrombotic events. This was something they didn't anticipate in the clinical trial, Rocket AF. When the trial was over, you couldn't access the drug anymore unless you were in the long-term extension. So the drug was stopped. What do you put these patients on? You had to put them back on warfarin, okay? But they didn't give them a protocol how to stop Xarelto and put them on warfarin. That's where they got into trouble and had strokes because Xarelto's got a short half-life. It gets out quickly. How long does it take for a warfarin to work? Seven to 10 days for most people. And we don't overlap that long. We don't have any overlap data. So what they're recommending is bridge these patients. So when you stop Xarelto, stop the Bigatran, stop Apixaban, you put them on heparin, alumiliquid heparin, until they have a therapeutic INR and warfarin. You have to bridge. And one of the things that gets us into trouble, because this box warning is now for all three. Prodaxa added it this year, the same box warning. Apixaban has the same box warning about discontinuing this new drug when you put them back on warfarin. Because when you start warfarin, Warfarin turns off the liver from producing vitamin K dependent factors. And two of those factors are natural anticoagulants, protein C and protein S. You turn those off first. Then you have an excess of the procoagulant factors, 2, 7, 9, and 10. So what you do, you increase the risk acutely when you start warfarin because you've taken away the two natural anticoagulants first, protein C and protein S. And that flips the balance in the opposite direction that you want to go. They're not adequately controlled on warfarin until the INR is two as a minimum. So unless it's two for two consecutive days, I don't stop my heparin alumicide heparin because you put him at risk for stroke or systemic embolization. That's the key for all three of these drugs. Be careful when you're switching back to warfarin. You have a question? Okay, when you stop one of these drugs post-hip and knee replacement, no, we've not seen any increased risk, okay? And that would be true for heparin, low molecular heparin, we've not seen, and that's why the duration of uh, prophylaxis is 12 days for hips, 35 days for knees, or for hips, and 12 for knees because of that data, okay? So they've looked at that in all the trials. Now, this one does have two other indications. Talked about that. This is the Einstein DVT trial, treatment of DVT with rivaroxaban. The dose, again, is totally different. The dose in this trial is 15 milligrams twice a day with food for 21 days, then 20 milligrams once a day for the duration of prophylaxis or treatment. Okay? So and this is Xarelto versus anoxaparin plus warfarin. So it's head-to-head -head in the Einstein DVT trial. And you can see your primary composite endpoint, no difference in risk of DVT or non-fatal or fatal pulmonary emboli, 2.1% versus 3%. The p-value and the range is on both sides of one. So it's not inferior. They cannot claim superiority over a noxparin followed by warfarin for treatment of a DVT. Death, TE, all the other things, no differences whatsoever. So the treatment, 20 milligrams once a day after 15 twice a day with food, each dose. And the duration can be 3, 6, 12, whatever you want it to be in the clinical trial. And what's interesting, they did extended prophylaxis in this trial. At the end of whatever the physician decided was an appropriate duration of treatment or prophylaxis with warfarin, they stopped the warfarin and they continued the rivaroxaban 20 milligrams once a day for another three to six months and showed a significant reduction in recurrent DVT longer than what they had when they stopped the warfarin. Not that warfarin increased the risk when you stopped, there was continued risk they had a DVT to start with, so what's the optimal duration of prophylaxis? Nobody knows. The current CHESS guidelines have not incorporated this because this data came out after the CHESS guidelines were published in early 2012.
So we don't know about extended prophylaxis, but they did it in this trial. You can see 7.1% with the group that got placebo or stopped the warfarin versus 1.3% if they stayed on rivaroxaban for extended prophylaxis. There's also the Einstein PE trial. So this has got an indication to treat DVT and to treat PE. Again, versus an oxparin warfarin, no significant difference. Again, not inferior. The trend's actually a little bit better with warfarin and an oxparin than rivaroxaban, but no significant difference. And again, none of the outcomes are different either. And the bleeding rate is not significantly different either. So again, your dose is the same for DVT and for PE. 15 milligrams twice a day with food for 21 days, then 20 milligrams once a day for the duration of your prophylaxis with food, each dose with food. Question. Yes? We don't know. We don't have, they haven't been studied. That's the problem. That's why it's only approved for non vivar AFib. If you have valvular heart disease, there are case reports where they've used these drugs, including dabigatran, and have valvular thrombosis. The doses are going to be totally different. They're being studied. The cancer patient right now, anoxaparin is my drug of choice for malignancy, not warfarin. And again, I don't have data with these drugs in those patients. Those are studies that are underway. So right now, until we get the data, I'm not going to recommend you go there. So this is your traditional patient with non vivar AFib, DVT, PE, that you'd normally treat with warfarin who don't have any of those special things that we don't have data on. That's where we are. Now, the companies are anxious to get that data, and those studies are underway, but we don't have it yet. Just like for valvular AFib, we have no data. We'd like to have an alternative Warfarin's our drug of choice. We can monitor the intensity. We don't know what we're doing with these drugs. That's why we don't want to use them outside their approved indications. And their indications are related to the patients and the clinical trials that were done. That's why it's important. And this guy's about $250 to $300 for a month's supply. All three doses essentially cost the same for a month's supply. Okay? What else can we answer for you? Yes. The data we have right now, that's where warfarin is still a drug of choice, but let me back up real quick here, because we now have an FDA-approved drug for uh, a warfarin antidote. This one, approved back in April, Kcentra by Bering. It's prothrombin complex concentrate. It actually has factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as protein, C, protein S in it. It comes from pooled plasma but you don't have to do blood typing like you do for fresh frozen plasma. You don't have to thaw it out. And it is approved for those with life-threatening warfarin bleeds. And it reverses it within 30 minutes. You still need to give it along with vitamin K because you still need to synthesize new clotting factors. You're just giving them preformed 2, 7, 9, and 10 and protein C and protein S with this infusion. It's an IV infusion. You can give up to 10 vials, and each vial is over $500, and it lasts for less than 24 hours once you give it. It's not a long-acting drug, but it reverses it within 30 minutes. It's also been used to reverse bleeding with these new drugs, but it's not an approved indication. There are several other anecdotes in the pipeline, especially for the 10A inhibitors, that are being developed, but right now, Prothrombin complex concentrate is what most people are trying if they have a bleed with one of these new agents. And again, it's not as predictable, and we don't have a recommendation to do it. It's investigational. It is not within the label for any drug, and it's not in the guideline right now that we do it, but that's what most people are using. So this is the drug. No, because it's off-label but it's only going to be used in the hospitalized setting for life-threatening bleeds. And these drugs are not reversible by giving vitamin K. Vitamin K does not turn these patients around quickly, 
and sometimes even blood transfusion and fresh frozen plasma have not turned these people around quickly either. So it's not very predictable. I wish I had a better recommendation, but this is the only FDA approved drug, but it's for warfarin overdose only. And in the clinical trials, you didn't get this if you'd had a DVT or PE or an event within three months, you were excluded in the trial. Because what you've done, you just made these people clot again who are on warfarin. And if they had an indication for warfarin, you put them at risk for a thrombosis when you turn these things around too. So that is a possible side effect of any of the drugs we're doing this with. So that's a concern, and this one's not been studied in anybody who had the uh, warfarin for less than three months. Even if they had a life-threatening overdose, there's no data. They were excluded in the clinical trials to get it approved. What else can we tell you about? The new weight loss medications. I am not a fan, but I will show you the data. We have two. Lorcasra and Belvic, is, they're both scheduled, Schedule 4. This is by Belvic, uh, and this is for patients, and they have the same indication in the label, with a BMI greater than or equal to 30 or a BMI greater than or equal to 27 if they have comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. And this one appears to stimulate serotonin 2C receptors in the hypothalamus developing a feeling of satiety sooner. That's the proposed mechanism. The approved labeling is discontinue patients that lose at least 5% of their body weight after 12 weeks of treatment. It's a 10 milligram dose twice a day, fixed dose, costs about $200 wholesale for that dose. Here's their clinical trial data from the package insert. And I wish it was better. So this is placebo, the black line, which is diet and lifestyle alone. See, they lost up to four kilograms, peaked at 36 weeks, and trended back up a little bit over time over the two-year follow-up. If they got the drug for active drug, 10 milligrams twice a day for a year, up to 52 weeks, you see they plateaued again between 35 and 50 weeks. And when they stopped the drug, that's this one that goes right back up again. If they continued the drug for two years, they had the same effect, but they are lost efficacy over time, they're still on the drug here. Oop, my finger got moved. So it looks like, again, you peaked out at about 35 to 50 weeks, and then it goes back up even when continued therapy. This is not magic for weight loss. And if you subtract the placebo versus active drug, it's about four or four and a half kilograms greater than placebo. So it'd be 10 pounds better than placebo at the end of one year, and you get out at two years, it's still about four kilograms greater weight loss than placebo. And it's not a fun drug to take if you look at the side effects. Let me, uh, the serotonin stuff uh, basically gets some serotonin uh, side effects, and there's no long-term outcome data. One of the things the FDA is requiring is long-term follow-up for cardiovascular risk. We don't have the data. The human studies, why it's C4, it's equivalent to basically uh, Zolpidem in their clinical trials as far as the effects. The one that's got the best data is actually this one, Qsimia, also C4, Phentermine, which we've had for a long time, and to appear made, Topamax extended release. So it's a combination of the two drugs by Vivas. And it comes in four different strengths. Two of them are titration doses only, and two are target doses. So the first dose, 3.75 Phentermine 23 of to appear made, is a titration dose. So you develop a tolerance to the side effects. So your first target dose is 7546. That's where you stop to start with. And if that works, great. If it doesn't, you can titrate up to the second level. And again, that's the only reason for the 11 and a quarter slash 69. It's a titration dose over two weeks. Then you, your target's 15 slash 92. And that's the recommended doses. Pregnancy category X due to topiramate can cause fetal abnormalities. So you have to have a negative pregnancy test to get the drug, and it has to be repeated monthly to keep getting the drug. 
requires a negative pregnancy test monthly in females. Here's their weight loss data at one year. And again, here we're looking difference versus placebo is about two kilogram, and the active drug is 12 to 14 at the higher dose. So this one's actually got about a 10 kilogram weight loss greater than placebo at the end of a year. But again, what's happening at the end of the year? Is it still a downward slope or have they plateaued again? And I wish I had the second year follow-up data because I guarantee you it, it's not going to continue to go down. It's going to either plateau or trend back up again. That's just where the data is. And we believe the only reason this one's more effective is that we're hitting at least two different mechanisms. The body's too smart. If we give a single drug, the body compensates for it. If we give combination therapy, we hit two different mechanisms, it looks like it's better as far as the weight loss. But we still see a plateauing of effect at the end of about a year. It's not a continued downward climb at this point. So that's, this one does have better data as far as the weight loss itself. And there's actually a recent review saying this is the most effective weight loss drug we have to date. Again, the only one that's dual therapy since the old FenFen -fen is gone. But look at the side effects with this guy. Increased heart rate, greater than 10 beats per minute, 56% of patients in their clinical trials. Greater than 20 beats per minute, 20%. Two out of 10 patients will increase their heart rate more than 20 beats per minute. What kind of patients are we using this in? People have cardiovascular risk. Anybody think it's good to raise your resting heart rate more than 10 to 20 beats per minute if you've got somebody with cardiovascular risk? What are you doing to myocardial oxygen demand when you do that? You're increasing it. Not a good thing, potentially. Paresthesias due to the to pyramid, 20% versus 2%. Metallic taste, 10 versus 1. Mood or sleep disorder, over 20%. Anxiety, 8%. Impaired cognition, again, our friend to pyramid, dopamax, as I like to call it, 7 to 8%. Metabolic acidosis. 12.8%, hypokalemia about 5%. Those are all the side effects that are listed that were seen in their clinical trials, and people with high cardiovascular risk were not included in those trials. So the FDA is mandating to do a cardiovascular outcome study in patients with high cardiovascular risk who are obese and need to lose weight. Don't know what it's going to show. But we do know what happened to the previous Last FDA approved weight loss drug that's no longer with us, Serbutramine, Meridian, SNRI, serotonin norepinephrine uptake inhibitor. Why did it go off the market? They did a trial that was mandated by the FDA called the SCOUT trial. People who had cardiovascular risk factors and they studied the drug versus placebo. Increased cardiovascular events, drug went bye bye. It's gone, it's not on the market anymore. This drug has the same potential, in my mind, even greater potential, because the heart rate effects are even greater than what we saw with an SNRI, serbutramine. So I don't know, but this is a requirement for continued marketing of the drug. They have to do the study. So until that data is available, I'm not going to suggest. I'm not taking it. I'd love to lose some more weight, and 10 kilograms would be great for me, but I don't want to chance it with this drug and known coronary disease. Diabetes. I've got those risk factors, got disease. Uh -uh, I'm not taking this drug. Not until I get better safety data. And again, it's going to cost you about $200 a month. Originally, it was limited supply through two different pharmacies. Now open that up. So that's no longer the case with this drug. So that's the two new weight loss drugs. There's another one coming, Contrave, that's a combination of sustained release bupropion. Welbutrin in combination with naltrexone orally. And it also has better weight loss data looking like what we see with Qsimian. So the weight loss looks pretty good. The FDA originally turned it down, wanted more data submitted, so that is in process, and we may see that drug approved within the next year. So we may have a second one of these combination weight loss drugs of two drugs that have been around for a long time that have been put together just like these two guys and again hit two different mechanisms and the weight loss appears to be greater. What else can we tell you about? Yes? Yeah, uh, any new drug for uh, drug-resistant uh, sinus infections? 
drug-resistant staph infections. The antibiotic pipeline is pretty bare right now. There's not a lot of good stuff in the antibiotic pipeline. The drugs are, bugs are smarter than we are. Resistance is alive and well. We do have lots of drugs in the pipeline for HIV and, more excitingly, for hepatitis C. The FDA's uh, advisory committee met last week for two hepatitis C drugs, one by Johnson & Johnson, one by Gilead. They're both once-a-day orals. The first one, J&J's, is a protease inhibitor that's once-a-day oral that is much better tolerated and easier to take than the two we have already, the uh, telaprevir and bocepravir. So those guys are out there in combination with ribavirin and interferon, triple drug combinations, have efficacy rates in the 60% range. This one is once-a-day oral added to ribavirin or uh, interferon, and the FC rates in their clinical trials for type 1 is 80%. But what's more exciting is Gilead's drug. It's a different mechanism, and it does not require both the interferon and ribavirin. And it looks like it's got activity for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 genotypes, all six genotypes of hepatitis C. And to date, no resistance. It actually offers courses of 12 to 16 weeks, up to 24 weeks, depending on the genotype, versus 48 weeks or longer with some of the drugs. You may not have to give it with interferon. It's been looked at in patients who failed or don't tolerate interferon and has efficacy rates in the 60 to 90 percent range, depending on the genotype. It's oral once a day with minimal side effects. Less than 2 percent of patients discontinued the drug in their clinical trials, and it's being studied in combinations of two oral drug therapy with J&J's drug, the protease inhibitor, without any interferon, without ribavirin, and the efficacy data is due to be presented later this month at the uh, hepatitis C meetings with two oral therapies, both once a day, that look very promising. So it looks like Gilead's drug, and there's some data in the slide set that I'll post, because I just put it in last week, because it was not recommended for approval until last week. The efficacy data is really good. Oral therapy for 12 to 16 to 24 weeks two pills, both once a day. And it will blow the regimens out of the water we currently have, and they're suggesting Gilead's drug will be the new backbone of therapy for hepatitis C. We will be able to cure hepatitis C with some of these newer regimens. So it looks very exciting, and by December the 8th is their FDA approval date for the Gilead drug, and November the 27th for the J&J &J drug. So they both have been recommended unanimously by the advisory committee, and the FDA has no problems with either one of them. So I would assume by the end of the year we'll have both of these oral drugs for hepatitis C that are both once a day with minimal side effects, a little bit of rash and photosensitivity with J&J's drug. So you should avoid sun exposure, and you should uh, use sunscreen with their drug. But there's no major side effects seen with a Gilead drug. So both of these look like they're going to be gangbusters, and Gilead's stock has already gone through the roof. Okay, the monitoring is still, the, the cure rates are SVR, sustained viral response, and in the clinical trials with these drugs, within two weeks they have 80 to 90 percent non-detectable RNA viral loads. Within two weeks, the rapid responders are in the 80 to 90 percent with these drugs. That just blows any other drug regimen we have out of the water. So you'll still monitor that. That's still how you decide how long you treat and whether you got a cure or not. Twelve weeks after the last dose, if they have a sustained viral response, undetectable, that's generally considered a cure in the clinical trial. So that's still going to be monitored. And the good news is, with these drugs, you're still going to need to know what the uh, genotype of the hepatitis C is, because the 
doses and the combination is going to be different, but with these drugs, they appear to expand it, not just to type 1, to all the genotypes. And mainly we see type 1 in the United States, type 1A and type 1B, and there are some differences in response and duration of therapy and combinations may be different depending on the genotype. What else can we tell you all about? Invulcana. Got that one in here for you, too. Lots of uh, new stuff with diabetes, and I think it's right after this one. Invulcana, where are you? Coming up. Come here. There it is. Canafloglosin is Invulcana, and it's basically first of what's likely to be five or six new drugs in this category. Almost every major pharmaceutical company or alliance has one of these guys in development. SGL2, sodium glucose transmitter in the gut, or the, uh, in the uh, kidney, the proximal tubule. What it does, it is the mechanism where you spill glucose in the urine when you have somebody who has a glucose above 180 milligrams per deciliter, you start to spill glucose in the urine, and if you've got diabetes, that raises a little bit. It's probably 200 to 220. What this drug does is lower that threshold to 70 to 90 milligrams per deciliter. So as long as your blood sugar is above 70 to 90, you're going to spill glucose in the urine. That's how this drug works. Does not affect insulin. Does not affect insulin in the body. What it does is increase glucose renal elimination you'll spill 50 to 100 grams of glucose per day if you're on this drug, even if you don't have diabetes, okay? Because it lowers your renal threshold and to a range of 70 to 90. If you're above 70 to 90, you're spilling it in the urine, okay? That's how it works. It lowers A1C about 1 to 1.2 percentage points. So it's as good as metformin, it's as good as the GLP-1 analogs at lowering A1C. So it's a pretty effective drug from that standpoint. But by flushing that glucose through the urine, what's it do? It pulls water and electrolytes with it. It's an osmotic diuresis. So you're going to lower your plasma volume. So if you've got people that are on diuretics, they get dehydrated in the summertime, they're going to bump their creatinines, they're going to be at increased risk for orthostasis because that's still going to happen with this drug. And putting glucose in the urine is going to give the urine the risk for urinary tract infections as well as candida overgrowth. In both men and women, there's a significant risk of candida overgrowth. So candida vaginitis, candida balanitis are common in patients on this drug. We don't have any morbidity mortality data. Those studies are underway, but they're just getting started. So we don't know. It doesn't cause hypoglycemia by itself because it doesn't increase insulin. It only works to increase renal elimination of glucose. It's like putting the patient back to where they started with type 2 diabetes, giving them polys again. That's how we made the diagnosis because they had those symptoms. So those symptoms are coming back, but now they're induced by the drug. Okay? Comes as a 100 and 300 milligram tablet. It costs $9 a dose. So it's $270 for a month's supply to give you about a 1% reduction in A1C. If you have renal impairment, you can't use the drug. It quits working. So you get a creatinine clearance less than, than 45, you've got to stop the drug. Less than 60, you back off to the 100 milligram dose. So there's renal dosing adjustment, and you can't use it with a creatinine clearance less than 45. And there's a lot of folks out there with diabetes who would meet that criteria. It's been used in combination with every other drug for type 2 diabetes. So there's data adding it to metformin, adding it to a TZD, adding it to a sulfonylurea, adding it to insulin, adding it to a DP4 or a GLP-1. So all that combination data is out there. Lots of studies with the drug, but no morbidity and mortality data. We don't see any cardiovascular signals, but we don't have data they reduce events yet. So that's Invulcana, Canafaglosin, the first, and all these are going to end in Gliflozin. Amphagliflozin, all of them, if they end in Gliflozin, they're an SGLT2 inhibitor. They inhibit sodium glucose 
transport in the proximal tubule. That's where they work. That's how they work. Okay? So fairly well tolerated except for the urinary and the risk of hypokalemia, the risk of dehydration you run with these drugs. So you have to be cautious and impaired kidney function can't use them. What else do you have you want to know about? That's kind of the, the five cent version of that one. Yes? Okay, safety of Actos. Pyoglitazone is on my list of drugs I wouldn't give to my dog. Let me, when it first came out, it lowers A1C fairly well, and it also has good durability. It maintains A1C as good, if not better, than almost any other drug based on the limited data we have. Their outcome trial in cardiovascular safety was called the PROACTIVE trial. PROACTIVE looked at people with disease, and at two years, it looked like there was a trend that pioglitazone was better than placebo in these patients at reducing events, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So even though the trial was stopped, they continued to follow these people for another four years. The six-year data was presented last year, last September, at the EASD, the European Association of Study Diabetes meeting in Europe. Six-year data, no difference than placebo. Exactly, the curves came back together. So there is no cardiovascular event reduction. But what do we know about the drug? It causes significant plasma volume expansion. So they gain more weight with it than even glyburide in a head-to-head -head study. And if you add insulin to it, it's worse. And you put those two things together, heart failure comes out, and the number needed to harm for heart failure in the proactive trial is 32. For every 32 patients treated with pioglitazone versus placebo for two years, one more new case of heart failure in that trial, okay? So heart failure is a contraindication precaution with TZDs. In the other data we have, there was a trial that was done by GSK with ROSI versus metformin versus glyburide. At the end of four years, 9.3% of women in this trial had a new onset fracture. And that was added to the label for all these drugs actually about five years ago when that data came out. We now know that TZDs induce what appears to be drug-induced osteoporosis. And it's including not just women, it also happens in men. It's dose and duration related. It's about one out of 10 women at four years who didn't have any treatment for diabetes beforehand. So these are not elderly women. These are women in their 40s and 50s up to 9.3% had a new fracture over the four years of the trial, ADOPT trial is what it's called. Going back to look at it, the data from Scotland presented a year and a half ago at the ADA, 17% of all hip fractures in the country of Scotland, they believe are related to TZDs. One out of every five hip fractures in Scotland due to a TZD. The data from the UK, five to eight-fold increase in risk of macular edema, diabetes-related macular edema if you're on a TZD plus insulin. If you're on just a TZD, it's two to three-fold increase. That's been added to the label. And then you take the animal data and the Kaiser data in men, increased risk for bladder cancer in males on pioglitazone. So wait a minute, what do I want to use it for? No cardiovascular event reduction. A1C goes down and stays down, but that's a surrogate marker. I don't have any outcome data with it. Increased risk of weight gain edema, heart failure, macular edema related to diabetes. Diabetes related to macular edema, one of the leading causes of blindness in the world today. And increased fractures and potentially bladder cancers in men. So how many negatives do you want before you decide not to use it? France and Germany took it off the market. It's gone. We still have it. We could even see Rosie come back in the United States based on the recent analysis that Duke did of the record trial with rosiglitazone. It doesn't look like there's a clear cardiovascular risk. But all those other things I mentioned, except for bladder cancer, are there with Rosie as well. I don't want it. I don't want to take it. If I have diabetes, and I do, I'm going to take metformin plus insulin. That's where the evidence is. 
The evidence is clearly metformin reduces cardiovascular events. And let me show you the, the data for metformin. This is the UK PDS trial. Metformin versus insulin sulfonylurea versus diet only. All these are diabetes-related endpoints that matter. None of these are uh, surrogate markers. These are all poems, patient evidence that matters. Look at your number needed to treat to prevent any diabetes-related endpoint at 10 years in UK PDS. For every 10 patients treated, one less event than diet only. Diabetes-related death, number needed treats 19 at 10 years. All-cause mortality is 14 at 10 years. MI is 16, stroke is 36, and microvascular is lowest with diet plus metformin, but it's not statistically lower than diet only. This is the reason every guideline known to man lists metformin as first line. This is the evidence. And if you want to know what happens when you use insulin with it, that's this trial. This is the home trial in Archives of Internal Medicine 2009. Nobody's talking about it. These are patients who were not at goal on insulin with type 2 diabetes. They either added metformin or placebo to their insulin therapy. So metformin was added to insulin in this trial. They lost an average of 3 kilograms over the 3-year to 4-year follow-up. Their A1C went down 4 tenths of 1% more, while their insulin dose was reduced by 19 units a day on average. So they're able to reduce insulin dose, lower the A1C, lose some weight, but more importantly, look at secondary macrovascular endpoints, 0.61, 39% reduction in cardiovascular events in the group that had metformin added to insulin versus placebo added to insulin. And if you look at the number need treat, it's 16. For every 16 patients treated with metformin added to insulin, one less macrovascular event over the four-year follow-up in this trial. That's why the ADA algorithm shows, let me show you, oh, let me go back to it. This is the ADA algorithm. Metformin's the pink stuff. It goes all the way down, including behind insulin at the bottom. It's the only drug in the ADA algorithm that is continued when you go to intensive insulin therapy. You don't discontinue the metformin. It lowers your insulin dose requirement, helps you lose weight, and more importantly, reduces macrovascular events, even when you add it to insulin. The other thing that's a change from the ADA, if I can, oh, just which way do I go? Come here. Oh, wrong way. Come here. Go. This one. This is the recommended by the ADA for metformin renal dosing. This is not FDA approved. I put that at the bottom. Our label still says if you have a serum creatinine in a woman, 1.4 greater, male 1.5 or greater, stop metformin. It's not evidence-based. It's been there in the package insert for 30 years. It's based on the old fenformin DBI that came and went due to lactic acidosis. This is the current renal dosing recommendation published by the ADA, and it's in the label in Canada, the UK, and Australia. Their guidelines all say what's on this table. The U.S. doesn't, but the ADA has recommended the FDA adopt these renal dosing guidelines right now. This is published by the ADA. If your EGFR is greater than 60, no renal contraindication to metformin, max dose 2.55 grams a day is okay, 2 grams a day for most of us. If it's greater than 45, continue use but increase renal monitoring every 3 to 6 months. If it's less than 45 but greater than 30, prescribe with caution, reduce the dose to one gram a day, half the recommended dose, and monitor every three to six months again. They don't recommend stopping metformin until the EGFR is less than 30 in all the other countries in the world, and this is what the ADA has recommended the FDA adopt for our label as well. But it's not there right now. Our label has not been changed. But this is the evidence. There's actually a Cochrane database review. Every study ever done with metformin, no increased risk of lactic acidosis. 
There's studies with creatinines of 2.5 or less, no increase in lactic acid levels with a serum creatinine down in the range of less than 30. So this is where these guidelines come from, but it's not reflected in our FDA-approved labeling for metformin. Okay? So metformin is my go-to drug, and if I need more than metformin, I'm adding insulin based on the evidence. And there's not too many people that you can't control with those two drugs. So I don't have to have all these newer drugs that have no outcome data. And we have the, in September, we had two publications, New England Journal. We had the outcome data for saxagliptin, the SAVER, TIMI-53 trial. Increased risk of hospitalization for heart failure with the DP4 inhibitor, saxagliptin and glycin in their outcome trial at two years. No cardiovascular event reduction, but an increase in hospitalization for heart failure. We have preliminary data on linagliptin, increased number of hospitalizations for heart failure in their outcome trial examined in the same issue of New England Journal of Medicine. So again, we gotta wait until we get the evidence, but right now, let's, let's not forget the evidence we have with metformin and insulin. It reduces events, and that's why we want to treat. So that's, that's some new stuff there. What else? I've got uh, two minutes left. What about glimepiride? Glimepiride is the old, uh, basically, uh, Sanofi drug, and glimepiride is one of two sulfonylureas that has been recommended as preferred if you're going to use the sulfonylurea. Glyburide is one that nobody should use. Glyburide clearly has increased cardiovascular event data, increased risk of hypoglycemia that can last for days, increased risk for weight gain. So the ADA has not recommended glyburide since before 2009. Glimepiride and glipizide are the two preferred if you're going to use it, but if you look at the guidelines by the ACE people, Merton College of Clinical Endocrinology, it's their last line drug. Because again, it looks like there is some hypoglycemic risk, but it's less than with gliburide, and there also is a trend towards more cardiovascular events. So sulfonylureas have kind of gone to the back of the bus based on the evidence, along with TZDs, I'd put them in the back of the bus. Okay, the problem I have, and there's the data in your handout with drugs from Canada, there's no guarantee those drugs are coming from Canada. I actually did this, we had a radio station in Charleston this time last year that had an advertisement, and this is talk radio that I listened to on the way to work. So you can save 90% of your drug costs if you go to this website or call this pharmacy in Canada. So I did. And when you go to their website, it doesn't say it's in Canada, it's got Canadian in its name, but if you look, it said the drugs can be fulfilled from fulfillment centers all over the world. In fact, some countries like Bangladesh are listed. Okay? Do you want your drugs coming from Bangladesh? I don't, or from China. It doesn't say where they're coming from. So I also called the number. So I called the number and I asked him where he was. He's in India. He's not in Canada, he's in India. And I asked him what the cost was. I asked him for Lipitor brand name. I asked him for the price. And the price was essentially within pennies of what I'd pay if I went to a community pharmacy and paid cash for it in the United States. Then I asked him for generic Simvastatin, and it was three times higher than what I can get it in the pharmacy down the street from me. Generic drugs tend to be less expensive in the U.S. than they are in Canada. Colchicine in the United States is only available as Colchrist, six bucks a tablet. And that's because the FDA shut the generics down. Canada, they didn't shut the generics down. The only reason Colchrist is out there by itself is because it was on the DESI list. The list of drugs that the FDA had never seen data to prove safety and efficacy. They were grandfathered in. Ben Franklin brought colchicine from France back in the 1700s, okay? So it's been with us that amount of time, way before the FDA was ever dreamed of. 
So it predates the FDA. So no company had submitted data on Colchris or Colchicine, so the FDA put it on that list and said, if you want to continue to manufacture it, we'd like to see some safety and efficacy data. So the manufacturer, URL Labs, did that study. And they published the study, and it changed the dosing recommendation for Colchicine. They compared basically eight tabs a day to, to max of two tabs. And they got the same efficacy and much less GI side effects. So it changed the dose. So the max dose of Colchicine now is one, basically 1.8, three of the 0.6 milligram tabs per course instead of six to eight tabs it used to be. And drug interactions due to 3A4 and P glycoprotein been added to the label because they were studied by the company and drugs like 3A4 inhibitors, the macrolide antibiotics, will significantly raise the levels, increase toxicity. That's been added to the label. Wasn't in the Colchicine label. And because they did that, they got three years exclusivity because no other company did it. The problem is, it's three years is up, they actually got seven years exclusivity. Anybody know why they got seven instead of three? It has an orphan indication. Anybody know what the orphan indication for Colchicine is? Familial Mediterranean fever. That's in the label. That study was done by NIH. But because it has that indication in its label, it has an orphan status. It has seven years exclusivity. So there won't be another generic in the United States until that seven-year time frame is run out. Then the FDA will allow other companies to market generic cultures. In. Canada still has generic cultures. In. Every other country in the world does. The problem is, do you know it's coming from Canada unless you go to Canada and buy it and bring it back? That's the only way to know. Same with quinine, because quinine is outlawed in the United States for leg cramps where it's not in the rest of the world. Because of the FDA said, we believe the toxicity, QT prolongation, arrhythmia risk is too great. We don't want to continue to see it. So they pulled it so it's no longer a dietary supplement or considered a safe drug. All those are things that are unique to us. The other thing is the FDA uh, is trying to work with the World Health Organization, Interpol, to shut down internet pharmacies. And there's data in your handout shows you they shut down over 6,000 pharmacies in the month of June internationally, and all they did was take the websites and put a disclaimer on it. When you go to it, it says the FDA, the Department of Justice, the DEA, and Interpol have shut this site down. So it, that slide shows up when you go to that pharmacy website. But it doesn't mean they're not, they haven't changed. There's another one popped up somewhere else doing the same thing. And over 60% of the drugs from those pharmacies are counterfeit. They're not what they're supposed to be. You can buy Oxycontin hydrocodone without a prescription on the internet. It's not legal, but you can do it. And then the FDA has alerted us, also slides in here, of a scam. And that scam is you bought hydrocodone without a prescription on the internet. That's illegal. So they sell it to you. They send it to you. Then they call you on the phone saying, I'm with the US Department of Justice. I'm a US Marshal. I know you bought this drug on this date from this website, and you had it mailed to this address. That's against the law. You didn't have a valid prescription against the law. And if you don't want to go to court or have your salary tagged, you pay the fine. And they give you a fine. And they say in the website, the fine's anywhere from $100 to 250000 You. If you bought it through that, yes, it's illegal. But the FDA and the DEA said, we're not going after you. We're going after the people who sold it to you. We're not going after the people who bought it. But they're going back after you because they've given you everything you already gave them, and you're paying them a fine. And it's not the FDA. It's not the DEA. It's a third party in a southern other country, and you wire them the money, and nobody ever sees it again. That's what's happening. They're scamming you twice. You fell for it the first time, they're coming back at you with everything you've already given them. That's what the FDA is warning you about. If you see that, they give you an 800 number to call to report it. They're trying to catch the people doing it. They're not going to go after you. If you bought it illegally, they're not going after you. They're going after the people selling it. That's what they want you to know. That's also in your slides. Okay? And I guess my time is up and over. So, But thanks for your time and attention.